Okay, so far we've been isolating our discussion on motion in one dimension. But now let's go on to curvilinear motion, which is motion in two or three dimensions. So what we might assume is that we have a path, and a particle may be moving along this path. All right, so this black curve represents the path along which a particle is going to be moving. Now, this is one time where I do like S to represent distance, not really position, but distance along the curve. So if I travel from this location to this location, and keep in mind this is a curve, then I will have traveled a distance S. And that's going to be an arc length. All right, so I might do a similar thing over here. From here to here, I've traveled a distance s. Now, this is kind of like a portion of a circle. And we can look at this portion of a circle. I can continue my circle around. Let's say the center of the circle is here. This circle might have a radius. I'll label this row 1. And this is row 1 because it's all part of a circle. And there's an angle theta 1 in there. Now keep in mind that there's an arc length then along this curve. Okay, and that arc length I will label S1. And that is equal to row 1, the radius, times theta 1, the angle subtended by that all right, I can do the same thing over here, moving from here to there. You'll notice this is a much tighter curve, and so it's going to have smaller radius, rho 2, and some angle theta 2 here. And so S2, which is this distance, it's the distance along the curve, is equal to rho 2 theta 2. All right, so that's the distance along which I move. Now, another thing that's of importance in here is that there is a tangent to the curve. There's one here, and there's a tangent at every point, but these are the interesting points that I happen to be choosing. All right, so here's another one over here, best arrow in the world. But that's a tangent to the curve, but keep in mind the tangent to the motion is the velocity. So this is actually a velocity vector quantity. Now the direction is tangent to the curve, how much it's increasing or decreasing, uh, or what the value of the velocity is, that's hard to say. But imagine, if you will, that this is a nice curvy track, and you're driving along the track. My velocity will always point in the direction of my headlights. So the velocity is in the direction of the headlights. And I can speed up, that's my gas pedal, that will speed me up. So that's changing my velocity. I can slow down. That's how I'm using my brake for that. That will ch change my velocity. Or I can turn, neither speeding up nor slowing down. In order to turn, I use the steering wheel. So these three devices within my car are all accelerators. You know, when you think of the accelerator in a car, you generally think of the gas pedal. But in fact, the gas pedal, the brake, and the steering wheel all cause acceleration. Now, the way I represented that on a curve is the length of the arrow. And so the way I've drawn this, let me actually exaggerate a little bit more. V1 has a certain value. V2 has changed direction, and it's also increased. V3 has changed direction again, and it's somewhat smaller. So I've been braking from point 0.1 to point 0.2, Overall, I've been braking. And then finally, V4 is a little bit faster than V3, a little bit larger than V3. So I must have been speeding up as I made that turn. So keep in mind then that there is a distance traveled. That's the arc length. There's a velocity vector quantity. It's got direction as well as magnitude. And there's also some acceleration taking place in here. Now, it's also worth pointing out that along this curved path, this tangent to the path, let me uh, draw coordinate axes here. There's a light green. 
here's an x-axis and here's a y-axis and there's some angle theta down in here the tangent of theta is equal to the derivative of y with respect to x and so if this black curve has a function a y versus x function then there is a way of us determining what direction the tangent is the tangent of theta think about that the reason we call it tangent is because it represents the slope of a line tangent to a curve that's really where that's coming from so notice the direction not the value of the velocity but the direction of the velocity can be determined by the derivative of y with respect to x by the derivative of y with respect so nothing new in here the velocity but now a vector quantity is defined as the derivative of r with respect to time now you may recall from calculus if you wrote a function of x then its derivative you might write as f prime of x that's the derivative of the function f with respect to x in this case i'm taking a derivative with respect to t and instead of using a prime i use a dot this is a very standard notation for time derivatives and so the derivative of position with respect to time i can write as r dot and the dot always 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 signifies a derivative with respect to time now keep in mind in three dimensions this is the derivative of x with respect to time in the i hat direction plus the derivative of y with respect to time in the j hat direction plus the derivative of z with respect to time in the k hat direction and that just comes from the summation rule remember we can write r which may be a function of time as x which is a function of time in the i hat direction plus y which is a function of time in the j hat direction plus z which is a function of time in the k hat direction that's very important to remember x y and z as functions of time are independent of each other now the track or the road might force a dependence but in general they're independent of each other and when i take the derivative of a summation i take the sum of the derivatives that is to say i do this derivative then this derivative then this derivative keep in mind i j and k are all constants and so their derivative doesn't we don't worry about that we take the derivative of the other stuff the x the y and the z we're going to see later on that unit vectors are not always constant and then we do have to be careful we'll get to that at a later point acceleration is the derivative of velocity with respect to time so this would be the derivative of v sub x with respect to time in the i hat direction plus the derivative of v sub y with respect to time in the j hat direction plus the derivative of v sub z with respect to time in the k hat direction or this might be x double dot in the i hat direction plus y double dot in the j hat direction plus z double dot in the k hat direction both of these notations are the same thing both of them are the same thing so when i take the derivative of vector quantities vector functions i utilize the summation rule we've already talked about that the product rule becomes a little more interesting because remember when we talk about vectors there's two kinds of products there's the dot product which is also called the scalar product why because when you're done with this it gives you a non-vector a non-vector okay but the cross product is a vector product because when you do the vector product this cross product you end up with a vector but the product rule would hold if i had a vector a dotted with a vector b and i wanted to take the derivative of this product with respect to time it's the derivative of the first so the derivative of a with respect to time dotted with b plus a dotted with the derivative of b with respect to time same thing would hold if I wanted to take a derivative with respect to time of a cross b 
this would be the derivative of a with respect to time crossed with b plus a cross the derivative of b with respect to time. So we can do product rule or summation rule on vector quantities. All right, going back to the summation rule real briefly, the derivative with respect to time of a plus b is the derivative of a with respect to time plus the derivative of b with respect to time. Okay, so in the rectangular system, we have an x-axis, a y-axis, and a z-axis. Okay, an x, a y, and a z-axis. And your position is equal to x in the i direction plus y in the j direction plus z in the k direction. You might see this written as r sub x in the i direction plus r sub y in the j direction plus r sub z in the k direction. And again, as I stated before, when I take the derivative of r with respect to time, well, let me do the product rule on the xi here. That would be the derivative of x with respect to time times i hat plus x times the derivative of i hat with respect to time. But i hat never changes. And so the derivative of i hat, since it's constant, is zero. Same thing holds true for the derivative of j hat and the derivative of k hat with respect to time. They're going to be zero. So I'm just going to add to this the derivative of y with respect to time times j hat plus the derivative of z with respect to time times k hat. And I can do the same thing with a second derivative beyond this. All right, so I just work in the x, y, z coordinate system when I'm working with rectangular components. And it's fairly straightforward. When we get into other coordinate systems, it'll become a little trickier, but we'll worry about that later. One special example of rectangular coordinate systems is projectile motion. An object is moving in projectile motion, then the acceleration is constant. Ah, so I have a constant acceleration. I have a constant acceleration. That's good news because now I can use all of those constant acceleration equations. But notice the acceleration is strictly in the j direction. So remember from a couple of days ago, x was equal to x naught plus v naught in the t direction plus one half a t squared. That was an equation that was associated with constant acceleration. But in the x direction, there is no acceleration. So this would be the x acceleration. But notice the equation, there is no acceleration in the x direction. So this is actually uniform rectilinear motion. So x is equal to x naught, the initial x position, plus the initial x velocity, which never changes, times t. But in the y direction, I have the initial y position plus v naught in the y direction. Okay, now there could be both of those. There could be an x and a y velocity. In fact, there normally is times t minus, because of this negative sign right here, one half g t squared, because gravity only works in the g direction. We're not going to worry about uh, the k direction now. We're going to stick with two dimensions. So in projectile motion, when you work problems with projectile motion, use this equation for the x motion and this equation for the y motion. Of course, you can also use v sub y squared equals v0 in the y direction squared plus 2 times negative g times the change in y. You can't use the change in x because there's no g, no acceleration in the x direction. You also have v0 in the y direction minus gt equals v in the y direction. All right? In the x direction, v naught and the x never changes. So there is no worries about the velocity in the x direction because whatever it is, is constant. Okay, so horizontal motion is constant. Vertical motion is either speeding up or slowing down depending upon which direction the object is traveling. Okay, so projectile motion is a very special case of two-dimensional uh, two-dimensional accelerated motion.